Now let's look at the right-hand side of the equation. Remember from earlier, we need to add together two equations for the second node of the grid. In the equation for the second node of the grid, we have the derivative of the unknown as obtained from the second element equation for element one. So that's this term. So we're gonna have DEZ uh, node two for element one, D, DX. And we're subtracting the derivative of the unknown at the same node, node two of the grid, but this term is for the, from the first element equation for element two. So we're gonna have minus DEZ node two of the grid and element two. In other words, we're subtracting the derivative of the unknown at the same location in space. They're both at the second node of the grid. Now this quantity could be equal to zero if we have an exact solution for EZ. So if we have an exact solution for our unknown. Because the exact solution of the problem will have a continuous derivative across the entire domain. However, the solution provided by our finite element model will be an approximate solution since we're solving for the weak form of the wave equation and we decided to use linear interpolation functions. For linear interpolation functions, the first derivative, dEZ dx, or the slope of EZ, is a constant across each element, but there may be a step discontinuity at the boundary between elements here because we never enforced continuity of the unknown across element, element bound, boundaries. On the other hand, we can imagine that as the number of elements is increased, then we can say that this is going to be about equal to zero. So we can say if the resolution is high enough for our grid. So for now, let's assume that our resolution will be high enough that we can approximate all of the B terms for the internal nodes whenever we have two equations we're adding together. So not at the two endpoints of the domain, but for all the internal nodes. So we'll be able to approximate those to be about equal to zero. So let's initialize the B array and set all of the terms initially equal to zero. So this is going to be B is equal to zeros and it's going to be of size nn comma one. But let's not forget the very first term in the B array and the very last term of the B array, which correspond to the first and last nodes of the entire grid. We're not subtracting two terms at the first or the last node of the grid because there aren't two equations to combine at those nodes. So the first term of the B array will be minus dez1 dx and then we'll have a whole bunch of zeros. And the very last term will be DEZNN DX. So this is the form of our B array. We will need to consider the boundary conditions for the grid in order to figure out if the first or the last value in the B array here needs to be set to something other than zero. So let's consider the boundary conditions next. Let's first consider the boundary condition on the left side of the grid. The left side of the grid is a PEC, and the electric field tangential to the PEC is equal to zero. And that's because we defined our wave as propagating in this direction, incident on the PEC. So the easy component at the very first node of the grid will always be equal to zero. EZ at x equals zero, is what we're calling EZ node one, and that's equal to zero. So as a result, the value of the unknown is already known at that location. And so we don't need to solve for EZ at that node. But wait, we have an equation in our global system of equations that corresponds to the node, the unknown at node one. And now we're saying we already know what EZ is at node one, is equal to zero. So how can we deal with this? Come up with a list of everything you think we should do to our global matrix equation, the K times EZ is equal to B. What all do we need to do to our global matrix equation? 
In order to incorporate this boundary condition into our uh, equation that we'll be solving and using to solve for our unknown easy 